Thank you for leading us in prayer, Fernie. We're blessed to have you as a brother. I'm thankful for you. And you're not paying attention, but I'm thankful for you, Fernie. Shh. Is this what the rest of you guys are like at church, too? Two seconds later, after I start preaching, just chasing butterflies in the fields of your mind. No! <laughs> no, no, let's focus. Before we send the littles out, the babies, that is, let's just celebrate real quick that over 400 people came through our Christmas program, A Walk to Christmas. Amen! And ticket sales alone got up to $2,700, and there were other gifts given to this. So we raised a bunch of money that we're going to give away to families in need, and praise God, that is what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. It's about honoring Jesus, focusing on Him, and giving to other people. And let's keep that alive, like the goofy songs say. Let's make it last all year. Keep that love and that generosity going. All right, little babies. Little three and under is going with our wonderful nursery crew, Eliza and Isabel. Yeah, clap for them, Mesa. I love that exuberance. Our nursery's awesome. Clap for them. That's you. Yeah, go with Isabel. Go with her. Good job. Are you the only three-year-old then? Well, you guys can kind of decide what you want to do then, girls. <laughs> All right. All right. Awesome. And the rest of you kids, it's time to stay in service. And guess what? I've got an awesome illustration for you this morning you're going to love. I've got some seeds here. Now, confession time, because church gathering in Jesus' name is an appropriate time to confess your sins and pray for each other that you may be healed. So who ate too much sugar over Christmas and New Year's? Okay, the Lord forgives you. <laughs> And me, because I was raising my hand too. I had too many candy canes. Ah, they might tell us about Jesus, but that doesn't mean I can just eat as many as I want, right? Corbin, you ate too much sugar over Christmas? All right, well, the Lord forgives you too. At home, you're forgiven, but don't keep going down that path. And because of that, I have here my seeds. You don't know if you can see them from out there. Our wonderful, glorious little gifts wrapped in shiny silver paper, and they are sugar-free, and the commercials tell me that they clean your teeth while you chew them. It's Trident, everyone. The gum that dentists hate. All right, so hold your horses. You'll see what those are for later. In the meantime, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 7, Part of what we do on Family Sunday is learn how to use your Bibles. Learn how to use your Bibles, everyone. This is important. Get a Bible if you don't have one. Download one on your phone if you don't have one. And uh, no shame and judgment. We just This is really important. This is important for us to have. We want this in our lives. We need the Word of God. Can somebody say amen? That's why we come together to worship His holy name, to bless Him, and to draw close to Him and learn life from Him and His perspective. Jesus is Lord. Okay, Asa, what is really important? You're just super interrupty this morning. What's going on? Would get a treat. That's right. I remember. But that's not even your Bible, so why are you bringing this up? <laughs> oh, you're thinking of others. Oh, God bless you, son. They will get a treat, I promise you. That's right. He's calling me to the carpet. I said, every family Sunday, when you bring your Bibles, kids, I will give you some sort of reward. It's true. So hang in there. Who, hold your Bible up if you brought it. Your own Bible. Your own Bible. All right. There we go. Hey, hey, I like that, Maddie. He got on the phone. That's okay. That counts. Download that Bible app. All right. Except for you, Anthony. It doesn't count for you. Sorry. Because I gave you a Bible, so you got to bring the paper one. <laughs> All right. Oh, I didn't give you a Bible? I'm forgetting. Oh, look at him. Man, jeez. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. It's a bad slurred oath. My goodness. There we go. That's a good statement. Right, Marston? Don't say jeez. It's too close to Jesus. And we reverence the name of Jesus here. 
That's right. My goodness. Okay, Isaiah chapter 7. Everybody there? We talked enough to give you time to get there. We're going to verse 9 because there's a lot in Isaiah chapter 7. There's a war happening. There's kings. There's governments. There's all kinds of things happening. But in verse 9 is what we need to hear this morning. And at the end of verse 9, not even the whole part of verse 9, we just need the second half of verse 9. Now, kids and adults, sometimes you'll see verses referenced this way. It says Isaiah 7, 9, B. And that just means there's an A half, B half of the verse. We're going to the second half. So this is Isaiah 7, 9, B. I'm going to read it here for you from the New International Version. Uh, Here we are. If you do not stand firm in your faith... You will not stand at all. Okay, we're going to read it again, but this time I want everybody to stand up because we are going to reverence the... If you can, I want you to stand up as we read God's Word again. After all, it is a statement having to do with standing. So let's stand up, kids and adults. Stand up. Noble, even on your one leg and your broken leg. Your brothers will help you stand. Did you know that? This is a good teaching point right here. The sermon's over. Brothers and sisters can help you stand. All right? Help each other up. Let's read this one more time. The Word of God. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Amen. You may be seated. The message this morning, the message this morning, kids and adults, is titled, What Do You Stand For? I'll say it again. What do you stand for? To stand for something, how many kids, how do, do you know what that means? It's a figure of speech. It's a saying. What does it mean to stand for something? I want some examples. Raise your hand if you want to give it a, a try, kids. Raise your hand. What does it mean to stand for something? Asa. Okay, that's good. So you said it to proclaim something, you, you talk about it. So it means to talk about something. It also means to represent something. So if you stand for something, you represent that thing you stand for. Does that make sense? Kids? Does that make sense? Like if you really loved chocolate ice cream and you said, I stand for chocolate ice cream, that would mean that everyone knew you were always talking about chocolate ice cream. And it was really important to you. And sometimes you left a chocolate mustache on your face just to make sure people knew how much you loved chocolate ice cream. That would be standing for chocolate ice cream, all right? Does that make sense? Shake your head up and down if that makes sense. Ivy, you got that? Yeah? Imani? Yeah? Makes sense? Caught you, Grandma. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just kidding. All right. So what do you stand for? Any other examples, kids? Raise your hand if you want to take a stab at it. Aliyah, what does it mean to stand for something? That's okay. That's why we're here this morning, to learn what it means to stand for something. We just read in the Word of God that it said, if you don't stand for your faith, you will not stand at all. What is the opposite of standing? Falling, crumpling, broken, brokenness, right? Standing is a symbol of strength, shoulders, back, posture, straight. How many of you uh, older generation know this younger generation needs some training in posture? (laughs) Some good posture training and how to wear a belt. Just cinch it one more button tighter. Just one more. We need to stand for something means you have strength from it. You represent something. And this statement is saying if you do not stand in your faith, you won't stand at all. You'll fall. You'll crumble, kids. You're going to fall. You're going to crumble. Now, what does faith mean? Someone raise your hand and tell me what faith means. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand, Anastasia. (laughs) Just, Just putting it around mom. Corbin, what does faith mean? Faith does not mean go away. Good, good try. Good try. Asa, sit up straight. I'm talking about posture right now. <laughs> what does faith mean? Faith means to trust. 
That's right. Trust and, and faith are synonyms. What's your trust in? What are you standing on? Now, kids, this is about you this morning, but adults, this is for us too. The world's shaking and has been shaking all year. All kinds of things are being threatened. Relationships, jobs, communities. Hear me when I say that, Bishop, if you take us in as a whole, we could, the whole township, our whole county could be labeled non-essential. If we were being literal with the word essential. You know, we keep a few power plants. What else do we produce? Nothing. Nothing. Except for, that's in an ungodly sense. What about the fruit of the Spirit? What about what life's actually about? What about the good things in life? What are the good things in life? We can produce a lot of that in Bishop. Anybody look at the, the mountain ranges as you came to church this morning? Anybody seen the beauty we're surrounded by or, or that was in your own car, your own family? Kids and adults. All right, now we're all, uh, before we spread these seeds, we're all going to talk about the good things in life. Somebody tell me, what are the good things in life? Let's start shouting them out. What are the good things in life? Food. Amen. Yeah. Marriage. Family. Candy canes. Water. <laughs> what are other good things in life? Aliyah. Parents. She's still thinking. Brothers. Grandparents. Now let's go to the spiritual good things. What makes a relationship good? What are the fruits of God's Holy Spirit? Somebody shout some of them out. Joy. joy. That's what we want. We want more joy. Love. love. Yeah. No, but we want love. Self-control. That's good. We can peace. Now, if we, if we view that as generosity, giving, gentleness. Oh, you said gentleness. Sorry. Got that wrong. That's true. Generosity is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> it can fall under kindness. Faithfulness. Now, everybody answer me on this one. Can we produce those things in Bishop California? Online, if you're at home, can we produce those things? All right, but there's only one way to produce those things. We've got to be a garden... And Jesus has to be the master of the garden. you got to have, if you don't say it with me, if you don't stand for your faith, you won't stand at all. All right, turn to Mark chapter 4. So the whole focus of the next few months is discipleship. Who do we live for? What do we stand for? Everybody out in the world is losing their mind. They don't really know what they stand for. They don't really know what their hope is in. And let me say this, as you're finding your way to Mark chapter 4, the reason why we're meeting in person still is not because it's perfectly safe. Life has never been perfectly safe. We just believe in Jesus that this is worth the risk. Amen. You, let me say that again. Do you understand? It's not, that it's, it's not that it's perfectly safe. It's that meeting to study God's word, to praise him, to love each other, to build each other up is worth the risk. That's why we go out to support our local businesses too. Restaurants are non-essential. But the relationships we have with the people who own the restaurants and the community we share at, at those places and the way it makes a, a hospitable attitude and area for Los Angeles to come and Reno to come and people from Vegas to come to, to Bishop, California, Inyo County and experience the goodness of God in this place. That's why it's essential. That's why we support it. That's why we want those things open. Because the essential, the essential fruit is, is the... Often you can't see it with your eyes. You can't feel it. It's the intangible. The essential is the spiritual fruit. So Mark chapter 4, we're going we're gonna to learn about a farmer, kids. How many of you guys know a little bit about farming? Raise your hand. And adults. All right, let's jump in then. Chapter 4, verse 1. Oh, man, my tablet keeps turning off by itself. Oh, goodness. All right, I need some help up here. All right, we're ready now. 
I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation now. Some of you who have gotten a Bible in this church have one of those. Is this New Living? Hey, 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 we're ready. David, you're such a stud. Godly man. Here we go. Once again, Jesus began uh, teaching by the lakeshore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. We've had a few messages that incorporate boats, huh, family? You remember that boat story, Eliah? All right, let's keep going. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Well, that's a story. Kids, a parable, Isaac, means a story that has a meaning. So this story that Jesus told about a farmer spreading seed has a meaning. Okay, now Jesus is going to tell us the meaning. Let's read on in verse 13. Oh, sorry, verse 10. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parable meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, but, what I, but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders, so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to them. So the seed represents God's word. All right, I've got seed here. And it's not very heavy. But it is heavy enough that it might cause some discomfort if it poked you in the eye. And I say that because in a moment I'm about to throw it out on the fields of the church. You're safe at home. I might hit the camera a few times and then Fernie will come after me because it's really expensive. All right, you guys ready? I just want to, if you don't want to get hit in the eyes, cover your eyes. Get ready because I'm going to spread this seed. Now, what does the seed represent? It represents the word of God. Everybody say the word of God. It's coming to the right wing first. Get ready over there. Guard that baby, Jeremy. <laughs> The word of God is spread abroad. The sower went out to sow the seed of the word of God. <laughs> and it flew all over the place. Some seed <laughs> fell. <laughs> careful, careful. Some seed fell on the path and the birds ate it up. <laughs> oh, oh, we need some right here in the front row. <laughs> The birds ate it up. And Jesus told them, the birds represent the evil one, Satan, the devil in our lives, and he takes the word of God right when it comes to us. Kids, have you ever had something good taught you and you just forgot it right away? Kids and adults, has that ever happened? <laughs> We need to pray and guard against that because the enemy is out like a roaring lion to take every good thing from us. And it's possible. It can happen. Just because the good entered your life doesn't mean it'll stay there. Let me say that again. Just because the good entered your life doesn't mean it'll stay there. Remember, as disciples, as followers of Jesus, we need to make a choice. We need to make a choice to give ourselves to him. And then the good will start to grow in our lives. What does it say? Jesus told them. Oh, let me find my place. The seed 
that fell on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Kind of like you this morning, kids. You received the seed with joy. I'm sorry, at home, if you can just see this. This is a wonderful stick of trident. It's going to clean my teeth here. Mm-hmm. I'm receiving it with joy. So you can receive. Oh, this is kind of gross. No, I'm chewing and talking to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, that's really gross. Okay. Putting that away. So you receive the seed with joy into your life. Jesus said it represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Verse 17. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They will fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing in God's word. Verse 18. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. So no fruit is produced. But the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Kids, wouldn't it be fun if you could plant sticks of bubble gum in your backyard and it would grow up into a tree that had bubble gum fruit? I thought about that all the time when I was little, Isaac. Partly because I read stories like the Chronicles of Narnia. Anybody read those books? They're so fun. In, in one of the books, the world of Narnia gets created and some kids are there to watch it get created and everything's growing out of the ground. Trees are appearing instantly and, and animals are being formed because God's making everything. Everything's so alive and one of the kids has a piece of toffee candy in his pocket and he wonders... I wonder if I plant this in the ground if it'll become a toffee tree. And he does, and they fall asleep. The next day, it it became a toffee tree. It was like dreams, dreams are coming true all over in this book. If we planted this, remember this represents, what does the seed represent though, kids? Shout it out if you remember. Do you hear Corbin? Is that you? Yeah, buddy. It represents the word of God, the word that Jesus preached to us. The very simple word, what did he first say? Repent, turn away from your way, because the kingdom of God is here. Where God is king is coming. What does it mean? Is the king in charge, kids? Let me say it again. Is the king in charge? That's why Jesus said repent. Get ready, because the king is coming and he is in charge. He will produce. He's the master of the garden. Jesus said our lives represent the soil. So when God plants his word in our lives, it can produce 30 or 60 or 100 times what was put into us. Remember, what's the kind of fruit we were talking about? The good, you were talking about it. The good things in life. Family, relationships, joy, love, goodness, the fruit of the spirit, noble. Self-control, faithfulness. What if those things were just, were just taking over the town like a crazy vine that was growing, like the things you've seen in the movies where everything is on fast forward, right? That's what Jesus is saying can happen with the fruit of, our, of his spirit in our lives. It can take over like a seed coming up. Like and we're going to have spring. I love winter. Anybody love winter? Oh, come on, Ruth. We know you don't love winter. But all these other family members of God's family love winter, so take a chill pill. (laughs) I love winter, but soon, in a few months, we're going to have spring. In summer, the cherry trees and the apple trees and the pear trees are going to be loaded down, brimming over, right? Breaking branches off, Jackie. Or remember all the, the, the weeks you've spent over the months of time cleaning up all those pears and apples, Marston? In Sylvia's front yard. (laughs) The trees, the fruit trees in our town, kids, get so overloaded, there's too much to handle. That's what Jesus is saying is going to happen with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. But, but, remember what this message is all about. What do you stand for? If we don't stand in our faith, family, we won't stand at all. We're going to crumble. We're going to crumble. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken in our country. Things that we've never seen happen before are happening. Bad things. Distressing things. Confusing things. 
But, but kids, let, let me ask you this. Before I go on to, to the good news, let me ask about the bad news. Kids, Isaac, Noble, Aliyah, you know, you guys younger, is that Jaden, right? You're pretty old, though. You're not really in the younger crew. Let me ask you, though, kids, have you noticed that things have been a little icky the last few months? That, that parents have been a little stressed out? They've been sad or worried? Raise your hand if you've noticed that people are worried right now. Have you been worried, kids? Have you felt that worry? Family, we need to wake up. All of us parents, we need to wake up because we, we have the light. We are the light. We have the foundation of Jesus Christ that no one can take away. But all this stuff is threatening to take it away. What do we stand for? Kids, when we stand for Jesus, that worry gets melted like snow when the sun's shining on it real hot. It gets squashed like when you stamp on a bug. We were talking about this last night. Ben and I, Ben was saying he was scared about monsters. Three-year-old, scared about monsters. And I told him that the Bible talks about the Lord's righteous right arm and his strength, that he can work salvation for himself with strength. So I was telling Ben that, that we can squash Jesus. In Jesus' name, he will squash those monsters like a bug, right? Worry, doubt, fear, <laughs> uncertainty, even the fear of death, separation, crushed. Jesus will reach right in with his strength and destroy those things when we stand on his word and in his name. That's when we produce 30, 100, 60 times as much as what was first given to us. Raise your hand, families, and parents especially, if you've received some of that love from the Lord, that forgiving, that restoring, that joyfulness, that freedom in his name. We can have that producing a fruit, a, a, a harvest in our lives and filling this town. Let's take it with us in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to stop here. So I don't keep you all day and you don't ever want to come back to church because I preach too long, okay? Make a habit of coming to church. Online, stay focused with us. Get into this. We are in this together for his name and we can be exactly what Bishop needs right now. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. What do you stand for? Stand in your faith, family. Stand in your faith and we will take this strength into the places where we live and work. And especially starting right in your homes. If the enemy's been grabbing you and shaking your foundation, tell him back off in the name of Jesus. He has no place in our lives. Remember what Jesus did with unclean spirits? Drop kicked him out of the door. That's what we do, men. Especially us. I just want to speak to the fathers and husbands and grandfathers. That is part of our, our, our role. Mothers, wives, same for you. But men, there's part of us that's just, we need, to get, we need to be fed up with those things that come into our lives. It's not the people, it's the wicked spirits that try to get in and meddle with things, right? The uncleanness. And we need to be fed up and just get it out. Get it out of our families. There's no, there's no place for that. In the name of Jesus. Here's your homework, though, since I'm finishing the, the sermon. Family, I'd, I'd love for you to just take the rest of this week and read the second half of chapter 4 and look at the power of Jesus. Talk about what it means when Jesus does the miracles that he does and how that will affect our lives when we trust in him. Can we do that? Just read the second half, half of Mark chapter 4 because that'll be more of you making disciples at home. You'll be taking a little bit of your time to keep sowing that seed and keep nurturing that plant so that it'll grow up and produce 30 and 60 and 100 times as much fruit. Kids, can you remind your parents to read Mark chapter 4 together? Make it fun. Get some chocolate ice cream or something. Because I stand for chocolate ice cream. But more importantly, we stand for Jesus. We stand for the kingdom of God where God is king. And where he produces his fruit in our lives. Amen. Amen. Let's prepare to receive communion. Kids, every first Sunday of the month, 
we have a little juice and a little cracker. And it reminds us, the Bible, Jesus broke bread with his disciples and he drank wine with his followers the night before he died on the cross. And he did that to remind them that when he died on the cross, every bad thing that anyone had ever done or thought, every single wicked and evil thing, that he was going to take the punishment for that and save us from that destruction. And so every month, that's why we remember. We remember that Jesus died on the cross, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world so that many people would be forgiven. All who would come to him, all who would cry out in Jesus' name and ask for salvation and believe that there's forgiveness in Jesus would be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. It's what we know is true. So parents, I want you to come. This morning we're, gonna, we're going to um, take it all together. Um, so go ahead and come up, parents, and grab enough for your whole family. And I'm going to let you, mom and dad, decide. Kids, you stay in your seats. Kids, stay in your seats. And parents, come up. I'm going to let you, mom and dad, decide if your children are ready to do this with you as a family. So come on up. That's good. Come on up, parents, and get implements for your family. The requirement for this family, there's one requirement for taking the Lord's Supper, for remembering that he died on the cross. You know what that is? Kids, anybody know what the requirement is? You have to have one thing before you eat this cracker and drink this juice to remember Jesus. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. I'll give you a, a clue. You have to have thankfulness. Thankfulness shows that you are submitted to Jesus. That you are trusting in him and what he did and not in your own strength. Do you have thankfulness this morning, church, for the work of Jesus? Eliah does. Uh, church family, these are a little bit hard to open, just so you know. Uh, there's a clear tab that you can pull off first on the top. And that opens the cracker area. So pull that off first before you open the juice. It's a little bit difficult. Parents, mom and dad, you might need to help help your kiddos. If you're like me, you might need help yourself to get into this. So let's try to get them ready and we'll all take it and eat it together. There we go. Got it. Life is worth the risk, family. Jesus is able to see us through. It's not that we won't face bad times or some of us might get sick or some of us might get COVID-19, some of us might get the regular flu, some of us might have cancer or battle through worse diseases. But Jesus will be with us through all of that. And he has conquered death and hell and the grave and given us life everlasting as our inheritance. So we're able to face the risk, amen? We'll take that risk. We'll live to the fullest. We'll produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What do you stand for? Somebody shout it out. What do you stand for? Let's say it loud. What do you stand for? That's what we stand for, family. We stand for Jesus is King, the one and only Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat and be thankful. And in the same way, he lifted a cup of wine and he said, this is my blood 
which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take and drink and be thankful. As often as you do this, our Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. Oh, may his power and his glory and his peace and his majesty rest on you. May he be your master gardener and produce the fruit that only his Holy Spirit can produce in you. And may you go out of this building this morning like one of those fruit trees just loaded down and even the slightest breeze or someone leaning up against you, joy is going to fall off of you and peace is going to just tumble down onto the lawn and you're going to be loading up baskets of gentleness and passing it out to your neighbors because you don't know what to do with yourself because there's 30 and 60 and 100 times being produced in your life. We stand for Jesus. Let's pray as we close. Lord, we love you. And we know the victory is yours. You've already won. And we're, in, we're still in this fight, Lord. And we feel the tensions. And I pray that you would equip all of us. Equip all of us to be that good soil. We love you. We're not going to be distracted by, by the choking weeds of life. We love you. We're not afraid of the persecution and the, the anger that some people have against you. We're not going to be like the shallow soil. And Lord, we love you. We're not going to be like the hardened path that won't let your seed and rise. The fa- we reject the father of lies with all our heart. And we ask that you would make us into that good soil. We stand for you, Jesus. Come and make your home in our lives. Come and produce your fruit in our lives. And everybody said, amen. Amen. We're dismissed, family.